So if you're a township entrepreneur and you're opening a business, don't listen to anything that they say in the market about this business. Find something critical to that community and then just do it better than the competitors. Musi. Hi. How would you rate your overall well-being on a scale of 1 to 10? Sure. Overall, that's quite a question. So um, mentally, I'd probably be about a, a 9. Um, emotionally, hmm, hmm, about a 4. Um, and then just in terms of my uh, community, how I feel in terms of what I've contributing to my community lately, I'd put myself at about a five, so halfway. Okay. Yeah. And could we dive a bit deeper into that four? <laughs> um, so the work that I do, you know, as a Cassie Catalyst um, is literally standing in the gap, right? So it's, uh, if I were to describe it, it's kind of like being a first responder, you know, so um, economic fires, are happening people you've got high unemployment you've got um, low literacy levels you you have all the negative financial or economic indicators right happening in townships and rural areas in our country okay um, and they happen without anybody hearing about them you know the closest thing we've ever heard to understanding or even just kind of being close to hearing what's happening in townships was recently with the taxi strike. That was the closest that these problems were now on top of the table. So, so we stand directly in that gap, constantly trying to hear from communities what the issues are, try to find and build products um, and provide services closer that answer to those problems in those communities. But it means that we've got to package them in such a way that they can appeal to the urban market. So whether it's private entities, whether it's private individuals, whether it's government, whether it's municipalities, it doesn't matter who the urban party is, but we're still having to package them so that they're palatable to that market. That's why I'm, I'm halfway. Okay. I, I feel like 20 years later, I'm almost there. Yeah, so that, that explains the kind of five. And what I'm also hearing is that you are exposed to a lot of suffering, especially from individuals and communities. Yeah. So how do you yourself not get sucked in and rather protect your energy uh, and still be able to help? That is a hard... It, it, it's very difficult to, to learn to protect your energy. You know, um, people always especially with black communities, you know, we, they talk about black tax, okay? And I say that with all the necessary kind of disdain because there's this misperception um, that helping somebody from your own family get a, ha a, a hand up has to be a negative connotation. And that's a very Western ideal, right? So we have in our families even by the definition of family um, in, in an indigenous perspective is an extended family. You know, my, what the English call a cousin to us is a, a brother or a sister. We don't have these, um, you know, at arm's length words that we use for relatives, right? So um, when, when I reach out and help somebody who's my brother or my sister from, from my uncle, you know, like as in my, my father's brother's kids or whatever, what would be considered first, second cousins in English. That isn't something that should be considered a tax because somebody would have helped my mom or my dad. It's just uh, paying it forward or paying it backwards. It's, it's that kind of concept, right? So culturally, these were things that we did without even thinking. And the moment we, we started sort of subscribing to Western ideals, then we started naming it differently and calling it a black tax, right? So the same thing happens with um, 
going into communities and people sharing their their difficulties or their challenges. Um, and I, I'm a sucker. I get sucked in. I, I do. I get sucked in. And it took me a long time to learn, to, to coach myself, to figure out a way to not distance, but to try and not allow it to damage my spirit. Because it does. It, I often say to my team, when we go into these communities and I sit there and I, I we present or we try to listen to new people first to hear what's going on, when I go home, people stuff CVs of their children, of their nieces and nephews, of you know someone in their family. They stuff them in my bag. I can't even go into supermarkets and do my groceries, you know, without the cashier saying, oh, I know you open stores in the township. Please, can I get a job closer to work? I earn 5,000 rand here, you know, in Seaport. Um, and it costs me 3,008 to travel. Mm. So if you open a spa in the township, please, can I go and get my 5,000 rand closer so that I don't have to tra travel? to get to work, please. So that that happens to me every day, everywhere I go, because you know now I'm that face of that person who opens stores for these big retailers in communities. So people think about transferring closer so they can have more money to do stuff with. And so I, I do carry the burden of people's empty stomachs with me. And it, it's an emotional thing. It makes me emotional every time I think about it because it's part of the burden that I have to carry, you know. Um, there's that that uh, biblical, you know, my stepdad was a priest, so there's that biblical reference about um, to whom much is given, much is expected. That's it's the na it's it's the foundation of of how I live my life, how I run my businesses, um, the things that I choose to pour my energy into. And I must tell you, majority of the work I do in communities, I never take money from a community. Never, ever, ever. All the monies that I make, I force on the urban people to pay. So I'm, I, I do struggle with keeping myself um, at arm's length. And, and sometimes it's, it's part of what I'm expected to struggle with because I shouldn't be at arm's length. I need to always be hearing these things. I want people to tell me what their challenges are because that's the it's almost the litmus test right when less people are stopping me in the street i was walking um on clifton like you know between clifton and camps bay the other day taxi screeches to a halt next to me guy jumps out and he's like oh my god sissy i i saw you on tv one time um doing talking about township economies and i understand that you you have um coffee shops I'm a barista, I work around here, don't make a lot of money here, but I would love to work in your coffee shops in the township. Please, can I get your number? Just like that. And luckily I had a, a business card, you know, so I gave him a business card, he got into the taxi. As he got into the taxi, um, the driver tells me a few days later when I saw him, the driver's like, you know how many people took your number that day <laughs> in that taxi? <laughs> so, but, so uh, for me, I don't want there to be a time where I'm not uh, uh, accessible to people, to the average person on the street. I want to hear that things are changing. I want to be able, mm. and, and that's the tally for me. You know, when I get into the to my team to say, we're, we're doing better, when I can say only two people stopped me today, right? As, it, it, as opposed to a mob, right? Like those are the numbers that we mm. should be chasing. And what do I need to know about your childhood for me to understand who Vusi is? So my childhood is fascinating in the sense, if you're looking at it from a, um, you know, like from an urban viewpoint, in that I'm I'm unique, um, bit of a turdanka, you know, the turkey chicken duck combo in the sense that my formative years of schooling started out in a white, predominantly white school, right, private school here in Cape Town, growing up as a township girl from Langa. Now. Um, I mean, I've got to set the scene. You can imagine leaving Langa every morning with, um, they had barricades, it was during apartheid. So this is in the early 80s that I was starting school. And leaving Langa um, in preschool, so I'm not in a uniform yet. And you've got barricaded military access points. 
care. And every morning my dad would take me to school um, and he'd go through these barricades and they'd wave him through. Okay. And I mean, I'm, I'm young, I'm what, four years old? I have no clue what's happening, but we go through no issues. And then when I was six years old, my father died. Still living in the township, still going to the same school, but now I'm in Sabe, so I'm in a uniform now, right? With the blazers and all. Um, my mom doesn't take me because she has got businesses to run, so I've got a driver. So the driver takes me to school in the morning. So now I'm being driven by a driver. We get stopped at the checkpoint every morning by these military guys that are obviously doing their in-service training. So they're young, um, white, um, sometimes Afrikaans speaking. Stop, stop my driver who is wearing a suit, like a full chauffeur vibe, with the cap, with the white gloves. This little black girl sitting at the back by herself, being driven to school. And they, they pull him out, they want to know who's this child. And you know, all of the things that I never enjoyed when my dad used to take me to school. My dad was flamboyant, like, I mean, drove sports cars, like left-hand drive that he imported, Corvette and a E-type Jag, you know, like really flamboyant, maverick, like a phenomenal entrepreneur. But anyway, so we never experienced this. Now I'm in like a sedan, you know, like a Mercedes, a sort of, I think it was in those days where we had a diesel, whatever, C-class or whatever. No, it was a 380 SE, wow. actually. Um, so there he is driving me in this vehicle to school, but we get pulled out, you know, of the vehicle. Um, and the guy looks at me in the back in my uniform, you know, with my ba blazer on and badges and wants to know whose child this is. Why is this guy driving this child? Where is this child going? So all of that indignity every morning, right? Then go to school. Get to school. We've got, and the school that I went to is um, next to a military base, right next door right, in Weinberg, um, and it's a convent run by Dominican nuns, so you get there to this, the gates, and once you're there, it's like you're in Kirsten Bosch, beautiful gardens, you know, sprawling, green, beautiful trees, the scene is set, and that place, it always transported me into this alternate environment, you know, forgot about the township, and so I spent all my days in that environment, where nobody othered me in that space, okay, like, I blended in, I was just another child, and everyone was oblivious to who I was in that space because, you know, I'm a black child. Nobody cares that we run these businesses or whatever. So I'm living this double life already. In the township, I'm one thing, you know, dehumanized at, at the entrance, but my parents run successful businesses in these townships, so we are, amongst our community, deeply respected, right? And every day I go from this white school into a business that's in this township. And people in townships are funny in the sense that they don't actually care about airs and graces. So yeah, somebody will say to me in our petrol station, there you go, there's 10 cents in those days, go buy, go buy me matches, you know? I mean, I don't care that you go to some private school, just go buy me matches, <laughs> you know? So I really got put into my place, you know, constantly. So I didn't get to be one of those privileged princesses who, um, got to live above people and look down and be like, oh, you know, we've got these businesses. And um, my mom is quite good at always putting me in my place, you know. So she'd always remind us that we make our money off samping beans that we sell in these supermarkets, off cake flour, off, um, you know, yeast, basic necessities that people need in their homes every day. And so if these people don't come in here, then we don't eat. Mm. So this life that we have, is as a result of the people, our customers. They are gods here. And, and she loved it. She practiced it. So my childhood was that, right? Um, and then it was, my mom got married to a priest, um, my stepdad, after my dad died, and he was a priest. And um, being part of the Anglican church community then allowed us to move into the suburbs when I was in Santa too. So there we were. Um, 87, living in Newlands, surrounded by white people, but still being black people in that space and constantly aware of what that meant, right? Um, again, the double life, the masking, all the things that you needed to do to stay hidden, because you had to stay hidden in those days. Um, police were always looking around for, 
disruptors, you know, and they called them terrorists, right, in those days. So they were always looking for that kind of thing. So we, we had refuge because of the church in that space, right? And the school was a refuge because of the Catholic Church. And at home, I was a refuge in refuge because of the Anglican Church. So my relationship with religion, you know, despite it having all those um, colonial connotations and, you know, um, all the negatives, for me, it was actually the one thing that actually protected me from some of the harsh consequences of apartheid. What stories were you told that actually influenced your beliefs and your thought patterns? Oh my gosh, so many. Um, but the one that would probably stick out for me, and it, it in hindsight has formulated how I built Cassie Catalyst as a, um, a changing the narrative business, as a um, correcting the misperceptions business, right, was my mom is a history buff. Right. So she used to tell us these stories about his, uh, historical things. Right. Um, and so there's a story that she used to tell about Ethiopia and how Ethiopia is the only country in Africa that was never colonized. Right? And that they had they they had not been colonized because they had beaten their colonizers. Italy was desperate to colonize them. And the, the Ethiopians fought in this war. It's like in the 1800s. They fought in this war where they beat the Italians, I mean, to a pulp, despite the Italians having superior weaponry, etc. These guys fought tooth and nail to bar them from being colonized, right? And so they had, um, they defeated them so badly that when the Italians retreated back to Europe, they somehow, I, I mean, I can't remember the details, but I remember her just saying, at some point years later, the Ethiopians had to go to Europe to go and apologize <laughs> to the Italians for beating them, right? So my mom was telling the story because she wanted us to understand that as my brother and I go into these white-only schools where we are going to be minorities, remember that Europeans are capable of controlling the narrative around your story so no matter what happens whether the truth is that you beat them they can turn it around in such a manner that you can end up being the one having to apologize to them <laughs> for beating them and so the moral of the story for her was more of a as you go into these spaces benchmark yourself first of all on the behavior of your white counterparts right don't go in there as a black person don't allow them to minimize you to being inferior. So if the white child is spitting at you, pull out phlegm from the bottom of your throat and spit that back at them, right? Because it doesn't matter what you do. The story that they will tell will always make them shine in a certain way. So make sure you get yours in. You know, that was the, that was the message. And so, um, and I'm going to... I always found my mom when I was growing up to be always extra, and, you know, and now I'm a mom to three kids. So I, I kind of laugh about it now because I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, I'm that mom <laughs> who's the extra mom with my kids like eye rolling. And ironically, my girls are at the same school that I was at and my son is at the same school my brother was at, you know, so um, we're reliving that. But the... Those, those tips that my mom was giving as a, a woman who had lived through oppression, you know, who had been married to a man. I mean, my dad was an old man. He was born in 1919, my biological father. So he'd lived through wars. He'd seen different faces of oppression by the time he married my mom. She was his third wife, uh, sequentially, not at the same time. <laughs> um, and so, um, she, so she gleaned all these things off the time. They'd been married for 20 years before they had children like my brother and I, because my dad had previous kids from his first marriages, right? Previous marriages. So she she had learned so much from him and his experience and got to understand his paradigms. And and she raised us with that, you know, knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so my childhood was um, lived through history, learning about um, who we were 
as Africans and understanding the value of the kingdom. So um, Shaka's prowess as a warrior, um, a trial's ability to fight. And it's, I, it's only now that I think about it, she always talked about war. You know, <laughs> and so I'm starting to now draw the parallels about, you know, this woman that raised me. But yeah, it, it was in hindsight, um, probably the best, uh, you know, in person they have the phrase where they say somebody has dished for you, you know, Pike. Mm. So she dished for me and my, or my brother and I both. Um, this kind of legacy of the history of who we were, you know, this dispossessed narrative. You are also well traveled. Yes. America, Asia, all these countries. Yes. I want to know what's the value of those experiences for you personally? What lessons did you learn? Uh, in Zambia, um, the Bemba have a saying that says, uh, the, the child who never travels will always think his mother is the best cook. <laughs> right? So um, traveling is, is the most critical element in, in sort of in my arsenal. Right of, of of what has gotten me where I am today, um, because when I left South Africa for the first time was on holiday when we traveled as a family, just about to relocate to the U.S. for a year. We started out with a world trip, and our one of our first um, ports of call were Liverpool in the U.K. Right on our way. Sort of so to sorry to hear that. <laughs> Yes, but it was critical in that um, as we got off the bus, we were on one of those tour buses, and as we got off the bus, the the woman who, the tour guide, she announced, you know, on the bus to say, so, and this is 1990, right, so I'm just setting the scene, and she's like, as we exit the bus, exit please on the right, do not walk on the left of the road, stick to the right, the tenement slum that you see on your left, occasionally has people throwing excrement out the window. So please do not, under any circumstances, cross the road, right? So I look at my mom. I mean, I'm 11, 12 years old. I'm like, excrement? She's like, yeah, poo. <laughs> I'm just like, there must be black people. In my mind, I'm thinking, there must be black people that work here, right? Because that's the apartheid exporting mentality there. And then we get out, and it's white people <laughs> in the windows. And for the first time, I'm 11 years old, and for the first time, I'm realizing poverty isn't black. Poverty, actually, can be any color. And having been raised in South Africa during apartheid, the, the propaganda machine had taught me that poverty can only be black. And so there I was, you know, sort of exporting this fallacy, right, of poverty, but they stuck in Liverpool, the Queen's Liverpool, right? <laughs> um, there are people throwing excrement in buckets. So they, they've got bucket systems, which is something that we thought, or I at least at that time, thought is definitely endemic to South Africa, and it's a poverty thing, you know? And so first thing, gone, right? That illusion, gone. And our journey out of South Africa was a gradual one, you know, into the UK, and then stayed there for a little bit, did all of the sort of, you know, Great Britain, um, and then into Asia and Hong Kong, um, which was still under British rule at the time, and then other areas because we couldn't really travel very much to areas that weren't colonies because we couldn't get visas as South Africans. You know, there were sanctions, there were places that didn't allow us to travel into. So we couldn't get visas like into Japan. We couldn't go into Japan then. They didn't allow South Africans. And so... Um, and then we ended up in California for a year, got to travel around continental US while I was there as well. Um, and into the islands, so Honolulu, Pacific Islands, into Hawaii, we got to go to Maui, we spent some time in Honolulu, which was phenomenal. Um, and because I went back for university there, so that was a great touch point. We won a trip to, I think it was somewhere in the Caribbean, either Barbados or somewhere. Um, and just before we were allowed, we were going to go, we discovered they don't allow South Africans, you know, because of the sanctions. So we ended up having, not being able to go into the Caribbean. But that trip around the world in all the places that we could go during apartheid um, sort of got me started on travel and understanding the value of it. 
but it was already playing into my mindset about what was real and what was kabuki theater, you know, mm-hmm. back in South Africa and starting to understand um, that there were these two sort of realities that I had to live in. And then when I came back home, um, my stepfather was now, had been placed as a, a Bishop of Kimberley. So the options were you go to school in Kimberley, which is Afrikaans Sprekende, um, or you go to boarding school in the Eastern Cape. And so my brother was already at boarding school when we had left. So my mom did everyone off to the Eastern Cape, right? So I get sent to an Anglican boarding school. And sure, what an experience. The place was so racist. Um, but having been in America for a year and then coming back, I was even less interested in minimizing myself. And and I and everyone in my class who was black, and there was a they had a big black student population, right? Um, none of them were seeing the things I was seeing. So I was this like renegade <laughs> and you know how they label kids, bad apple. The, the, the principal at the school actually said, you are a bad apple, you're going to rot my other great apple, so expelled, so I get expelled in standard seven. And I have to come back to Cape Town. Um, but because, you know, to my mom, I'm expelled on righteous cause, because yeah. I was fighting for racism, you know, or like alcohol or any of those kind of dodgy things. So at least I had maintained my dignity in my home, you know, for being an activist and then came back, so I was like red carpeted. So <laughs> I was allowed to come back home, but um, when I came back home and went back to my Catholic school that I'd been going, that I started at, um, I had to live at home by myself, because now my parents are based in Kimberley. So now I'm 15, standard eight, I'm by myself, and my conditions to live by myself, um, like as in, I've got staff, but I have no adult supervision. Right, so I've got a live-in nanny, a chef who cooks, driver who takes me to school. So I've got staff with me, sure, but I've got no like family adults that's responsible for me. So I'm literally on my own in terms of homework and managing myself. And then the other condition is that I have to run these businesses in the townships, make sure that while my mom is away, things are running smooth. So. I'm almost catapulted into a management role at the age of 15 without the perks. <laughs> <laughs> so no great salaries, no nothing. My mom is just doing a quick cost benefit analysis and thinking she puts me there. I'm her eye. I'm, she doesn't have to pay me. She's trained me, you know, all of those nice things. So I handle every morning the driver comes to fetch me um, early. So I start my day at 4 a.m., set my alarm, wake myself up. Driver's there to fetch me. All our cars are parked in the, the businesses in the township. So he goes from the township, comes to Newlands, grabs me in Newlands, and then takes me to the businesses. And I do, so we run a petrol station that runs 24 hours. So that means there's a shift change that I need to be at. You've got a supermarket, you've got a butchery. So I need to make change, float, you know, that kind of stuff. Prepare the money for banking, get a list of what is needed for our supermarket in terms of stock. Um, my school is in Weinberg, so when he comes to pick me up from school, go via macro archery, pick up the stock. I would have gotten somebody in the office to call ahead and place the order on the list, and then I just arrive, sign the checks, pay, leave with the stock, right? So I get picked up from this bougie school in a truck, branded, you know, um, with our family's name on it. So that was my life, right, um, growing up, um, very hands-on in these businesses, living these two lives. So highly disciplined from a young age. Um, And that was because of travel. It it taught me to be independent, you know? When we lived in Berkeley, I traveled on the BART train to school, you know? Got a bus outside where we lived. My mom was studying at UC Berkeley. My stepdad was lecturing at um, the Divinity School there. And so, you know, fend for yourself. Take a bus from where we live, get to the train station, take a BART Bay Area Rapid Transit, right? So take a BART train to school, Oakland, get off at the stop um, between where we get off to where the school is, where there's a notorious jacking of clothing there. Yeah, there's a, t- a public, like it's a township school where the kids are not, you know, not as disciplined as we are. So you have to leg it in between. So did all of those things, maneuvered that whole life. So learning um, that the world has to continue, people continue with challenges mm. all the time. It's something that I learned from being out of the country. 
being um, forced to be independent, learning to set my own alarms, find my own travel schedules, understand, quickly read rooms, what is dangerous, what isn't. Mm. You know, because there's no sign that says you will be jacked for your bull starter jacket here. You just have to gauge it as you get out. So all of those learnings helped me be the person that I am today. And I'm this cultural chameleon now. I blend in in every environment. I'm really good at that because I've had to learn it by constantly moving around, constantly being allowed the privilege of reinventing yourself, which is also a big thing. And how did the idea of Kasi Catalyst come about? 2017, right? Um, I'm partially retired almost, you know, so I left corporate um, just as I was starting to get married, my second husband and thinking about having kids. In my first marriage, there were, there were no kids. So this was going to be about children and settling down, you know? So met my second husband and he's in finance as well. So when my husband, when we was thinking about having kids, it raised the question of legacy. You know, you may have to tell my kids, what would I have achieved? Yeah, we've structured deals for these high, ultra high net worth white people, but what have I done for communities? Nothing. Um, they're even not in the credit policy. And so with my first child, I did that. We, she, I was a stay-at-home mom, and then I decided to my husband, actually, we're going to have more kids, and we planned for, I'm going to stay home, you know. Um, and so that was what we decided. Um, so I got bored after my child was, t- when she turned two, because now, you know, she's ready to go to play school. So I'm sitting at home, yeah, I'm doing a lot of reading. I'm upskilling, doing courses online and all of those things. But I felt like my brain was dying, you know, um, having never not had a job. So I started doing consulting work. So come 2017, um, I've just finished this big project that I was doing as a consultation for the city of Cape Town. Luckily, it had sucked up so much of my time that I didn't feel like my brain was dying anymore. And it was also um, a dignity project in that... The city of Cape Town was finally at the stage where they were saying they're ready through Patricia DeLille's office, right? She was the mayor, to then say these properties that had been owned and operated by black people in Langa, Kukuletu, and Nyanga for almost three generations, some dating back to the 30s, okay, are now available for people to purchase at a discounted rate and you know, all these sort of um, addendums to that statement. But They needed somebody to be the liaison between this group of business owners and the city. And I was that person. And I I got sucked into it at a town hall meeting. You know, my parents owned one of the properties in this. And so I was just attending as a potential purchaser, right? And I sat in this town hall meeting. and, And if you've never been in a town hall meeting, somebody needs to give you some kind of, you know, dummy's guide to a town hall meeting because, whoa. Um, uh, I, I was in that, like I was totally ill-prepared for it. Business school hadn't taught me, obviously. Um, life, n- nothing at any of the banks I'd worked at had given me any skills about that because that environment is insane. So um, Patricia Delo was there herself. She opened the meeting. She's talking about, you need to have people are shouting. She's busy, you know, saying, we, we were here to talk about what are the needs of the community. People are shouting at her. We want to own, you know, like chanting. We want to own. And then the guy who's like in charge of this association gets up, you know, dressed in his three-piece suit, you know, oldish man, very dignified. And he's like, what we want from you, Mayor, is we have a court order. And he that document in his hand, court order, high court from a decade ago to say we are, we need to get our properties back. And so... So the, the, everybody now, everyone is, yeah, we did this, yes, and screaming and cheering. And she, you can tell she's an experienced politician. You know, she was like, no, 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 I hear you. And all I need from you is to put one name forward for somebody who can liaise with our team because I'm happy to give you what you need. So please don't scream, you know, let's all bring the temperature down. And as she's saying that, he's like, yes, we have a name, the chairman says. And so I'm sitting there um, at the back watching all of this and... She's like, okay, who's the person? And he's like, no, uh, there, Zosibawana. And I'm like, what, 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 what? 
it. And everyone's like, I second, I second. Like, oh. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm sucked into this thing. Um, and I'm just like, no, no, hold on. And they're like, no, nope, done. Stamp, stamp, stamp. People are signing things. And Patricia was like, Vusi, I'm going to connect you to my person who's so and so. It's done. Everybody leaves. I'm still sitting in my chair, like, what just happened? So I get sucked into that project. And that's huge. So that that was where we started. So I'm done with that, and now I'm finally like title deeds are awarded. We went through all of this hardship. People are holding this title deed in their hand, and you can see their faces, right? And it, it, it it's a huge moment. And I I check it off my bucket list as well. Like, done, like big um, uphill sort of climb, and I'm standing at this top of this mountain, and I'm like you know banging my chest. I'm like, mm-hmm. You know, thinking, hearing the choirs, ah. um, and then my mom goes to church um, the Sunday after this big thing, victory on my part. She comes back from church and she calls me up. She goes to church in Langa, right? This church that she kind of grew up in. She comes back and she says, "I have never been so perturbed as I have been today." I'm just like perturbed. Like, what do you mean? I just got title deeds to all these people. And she's like, mm, 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 "Don't." Don't shine your halo so quickly. I just had somebody come up to me in my pew while I'm praying to say, it's great that your daughter's done this great thing with this title deed, but do you realize that now we have to pay rates? And where does she think we're going to get this money from? <laughs> just, and so my, my Western mentality kicks in, and I'm just like to my mom, are you serious? Like, you really think that that's my responsibility to figure out a way for people to cover rents as well? On top of every, like, 10 years of my life and my financial resources I put into this to get everybody access to ownership. And now you're talking about the, now I need to, I can't even begin to handle this conversation with you. So I'm like, mom, I need to go. So I hang up and it's, it, it, my mom has this capacity of putting something into the, into the sphere of my hearing and in that moment I don't realize it but it eats at me for like you know months to come until I resolve it and so I'm sort of in this semi-retirement consulting to business on an ad hoc basis raising my babies um, and then I hear from the city of Cape Town that they're doing a tour they're looking they've got some stakeholders who are looking to invest in townships so would I be available to do this like tour of all the properties that are in this book of 150. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Do the tour um, and then meet these guys from Pick and Pay on the tour saying they've run these um, township, they call them Spaza conversion stores, right? They've done that in Gauteng province. Now they're coming into the Western Cape in, in 2017. This is the year before. And so they'd like to bring me on board to help them. And so in that process, we then uncover a whole lot, host of inequalities um, in the system, you know, embedded with them. Um, and then I realize I can't do this as an independent. I actually need to be a business so that I can now be a consultancy, so that I can use this data that I'm now gleaning with these stores that we're opening with Pick and Pay to then become a package that I can then use to change the narrative. So Cassie Catalyst was born right there in that moment. We're a consultancy. We're actually going to be the McKinsey of the township. And I'm going to use these guys, right, as my fodder, my learning curve. And that's what I did. So from the pick and pay experience, then converted that into other clients. I got pay gas as a client, um, and they were from France. So while I was busy with pick and pay stores, I was opening pay gas stations. And I was comparing a South African-based business long 50 years in the game with a French company coming straight from France into Cape Town. And I got further with the French guys because they were all about equality, (laughs) you know, and these guys were constantly oppressing me. What I have a question. What do corporates misunderstand when it comes to spending habits of in communities, specifically townships? So this is a LSM conversation, right? Mm. So, um, I didn't even know that LSM was a South African construct until the French guys came, pay gas. Because I kept on saying, and so the LSM is, because you know, that's the jargon in corporate, LSM numbers and understanding that. And the French guys like, wow, 
it's this innocent, <laughs> you know? Like, it's an instant. Innocent. So then I'm explaining it to them, and they're like, oh, apartheid, apartheid, whatever. And I'm like, hmm? Google it. It is. It's, mm. a, it's a South African thing. About, so the NSM, it, the spatial planning, con, you know, the breaking up into those different categories of market, it, it's a fallacy because you, you, if you go into Langa, for example, today, you've got corporates who look at Langa, and when you say Langa, that guy who's making the decision, and this is a practical thing, when we were opening Pick and Pay in Langa, the, the the team that chooses the product mix for pick and pay, when when they were choosing the products, they were basing them on what they had done in Soweto, right? And I kept saying to them, Soweto and Langa are not the same demographic, you know, in terms of who the people are, what they like, what their customer journey is, right? And the guy was like, no, we've got a standard, we know, okay? So we learned this the hard way. And the, the misperception is, and I understood it only after having many battles with them on a daily basis, was that this guy, he knows Langa when he's on the N2 headed to Mauritius. So he's on his getting to the airport to go on holiday, right, to Mauritius. So he drives past these shacks. He sees the sign, Langa on the, on the N2, the exit. And then he, all he sees is shacks on the N2 right to Jake's Khawa, right? And then he's gone to the airport. To him, that's Langa. And when I was busy with pick and pay, I didn't actually realize that that was the problem where he was starting from. So I took it as a fully racial thing. Guy's racist. And I just wrote it off as racist and walked away from that battle. But then I opened the Vida. And when I was trying to get the Vida, little coffee shop in Langa next to the pick and pay, the Vida e Cafe coffee shop, it's the Vida guys that I read when it dawned on me. Because... The guy's like, you can't, how, what are we going to do about the price points? And I'm just like, what do you mean price points? He's like, no, coffee is 40 rand. And I'm like, and? He's like, yeah, but people can't afford that. I'm like, which people? <laughs> so off the bat, you know, their assumption is that everyone that lives in black communities is poor. And so they then pull into the, the you know, all the rhetoric around what is poverty, spending habits, find discount items, the cheapest item. But the reality of a township, and if you understand disposable income in dispossessed or dehumanized or subjugated um, communities, is that when I'm barred from buying property or from buying fancy cars because financial exclusion, right? It means that to differentiate myself in the urban space, to not be considered a hobo or homeless or a threat, I need to dress nicely. I need to be caring. And that's why people spend fortunes at AD Spitz. That's not white people that buy a 5,000 rand pair of Carvela. It's black people. Because that's how I differentiate myself. That's how, if I'm wearing my Carvela, if I'm wearing, I don't know, Dolce & Gabbana brand, I mean, I don't wear labels, but if I am wearing that label as a consumer and I'm walking into these spaces, the security guard isn't going to follow me around. The cashier isn't going to dehumanize me and say things like, we don't do labels here. Or, you know, when they swipe my card and there's connection failure, they're not going to shout, declined. You know, they're going to say, ma'am, can we try it again? You know, so when you're trying to earn your dignity back, it is critical for you. This is the perception of, of these communities, is to spend on the things that will differentiate you. So that has been history. And in that LSM, LSM model, the assumption is, I'm living in a house, and it looks at, do you have a telephone line? Have you got DSTV? Um, how many, um, it is one, it's telephone lines, it's income streams, and it's cars, it's all of those things. But in my home, in Langa, I had a chef. I had a nanny, <laughs> full-time. Um, I had a domestic. I had two drivers. I had all of those things, but I could have lived next to a person that didn't have any of those things. So I may be LSM top. Right? And that person may be LSM 3 or 1 or whatever. But we live in the same area and we shop at the same store. So if you don't have oat milk or, I don't know, rye bread, which I want and I can't afford to, to have, because when you did your assessment, you judged me on the person who couldn't who lives next door. 
and it's spatial planning. We can't choose where we live. So we do live amongst each other. And I only realized that with Vida, when I was talking to them about price points and, and they were like, it's impossible. People can't afford it. So we ran a pilot. We had to run a pilot to prove the concept that you are so wrong fundamentally. So we ran the Vida pilot. And they normally do a 10-day pilot for new markets. On day three, the CEO phones me and he says, Bessie, please can we have a face-to-face? -face? And this is now post-COVID, so the levels are kind of dropping, um, one, like one level at a time. So we're allowed to, to have restaurants open, but we can't really sit inside. So I'm thinking, he's calling me to a face-to-face? -face? There's got to be a breakup. You know, like he's <laughs> calling it, like he's like drawing a line in the sand. We're three days into our pilot. Oh, the numbers must be bleak. And I'm panicking. Um, so I get to, to this meeting and he says, and I'm thinking it's going to be a breakup meeting. Um, and so I'm preparing my, my, I refuse to break up speech. <laughs> um, and he says, I actually want to apologize to you. Mm -hmm. This has never happened. Pick and pay would never apologize. Right? <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm in uncharted territory. And the guy says, I want to apologize. We miss, we, 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 we misunderstood this market and we should have trusted you more. Your numbers for the three days are higher than we'd anticipated, one, but they're also higher than we've ever gotten in all the urban places that we've run. So as far as we're concerned, proof of concept, done. This thing will work, you know? Um, and from the Vida pilot, we actually learned that the average coffee bought was not cappuccino, as we all thought it would be. It ended up being a flat white, but almond milk flat white. <laughs> Who would have known, right? I have a question around starting a business in a township. Hmm. If you could give me three do's and don'ts, what would they be? So if you're a township entrepreneur and you're opening a business, don't listen to anything that they say in the market about this business. Find um, something critical to that community and then just do it better than the competitors. That's it. And then the third thing is when when you're looking for finance, which is critical, whether you are scaling or starting up, don't go the traditional routes. They, they will destroy your spirit. So don't go to banks. Don't go to any of the formal places where you would normally mm -hmm. seek finance because the, the journey to the no is almost um, they've almost embedded along the way there are all these landmines that you will encounter so you will end up at the no without legs <laughs> you know that's what will happen um, if you are an urban business so you're a private uh, corporate you want to go into the township first step is and it's the rule that I will, that most people use when they go into foreign terrain or foreign countries when they're traveling find a local partner with a local somebody that understands the environment but also verify their bona fides because everyone is an expert in the township everyone <laughs> um and so make sure you find somebody that's that's that is a, a good partner who's a good uh, tour guide so to speak into this market and then thirdly listen more first don't come in with I have a solution that I've learned in Amsterdam, you know, and it's great. Um, and we, we sell X amount there, so now we're going to do it here starting tomorrow. Go. It isn't that kind of environment. You need to come in, learn first, figure out the terrain, and possibly adjust your model or your product to suit this environment. Stop thinking you can convince people to change behavior because that's the biggest problem with outsiders coming in. Now, I've got a better product. It's going to teach them. So pick and pay comes in. They want to open liquor stores in the township, as an example. So um, we go and see some locals. They First of all, I tell them, you won't get a liquor license. They're like, no, 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 we're pick and pay. No, we won't get a liquor license. We've got the base for this. Done this before. So where to? You know, everyone talks about so where to model. Did it in so where to? Okay. So what I mean, and then they never got their project off the ground because of that inability to be agile thinkers to adapt to their environment, to understand that you can't, you, can't create, you can't just enforce something on somebody who's built a business for 20 years in that space. Nobody knows his customer better than him. So those, that would be my 
short advice. Mm, I know that you're very passionate about female entrepreneurship. What do you say to a female entrepreneur who has an idea and possibly has some traction, but is a bit insecure about following through, quitting a day job, and committing 100% to that business? What do you say to them? Mushrooms is actually the phrasing that, the, that we used about ourselves as, as that generation of women. We're mushroomed. Put in a dark corner, no lights, no water, no nothing, you know, mm, best, you know, best of luck, right? Godspeed. Close the cupboard and people forget about you. So you grow up with no support, no nothing, and you learn to adapt. You adapt to that environment. You grow up, you're resilient, you've got a high adversity quotient, you are the baddest bitch in the room. In every room, right? But nobody ever expected you to be. No one in your family. Nobody's expecting anything out of you. So because you've got none of the expectations, none of the, you know, sort of high bars are set for you. So you, you actually have the freedom to grow at your own pace. And that is a huge advantage over your brother or your male counterpart, right? Now you take that into the corporate space, the women, and we've done focus groups on transformation managers um, in the top 100 JC listed companies, right? Transformation managers, the ones who are black, majority, all of them actually are black, or almost all um, are black, and the ones that are men suffer, they've got like mental issues at the moment, going through the worst, you know, um, the harshest kind of uh, self worth issues, depression. You know, mental health issues, sadness, uh, oh, just a plethora of mental issues. But the women are fine. Yeah, it's a tough environment, sure. <laughs> but they are resilient because negative speak or dehumanizing or anything that somebody says to you when you've grown up in a mushroom space, whatever, move on. You're unfazed. And so, for those few, because they're a minority of black women who don't trust in themselves. And so the ones that don't, my advice to them is find a sister who is further along in her entrepreneurial journey. Allow her to mentor you and teach you the resilience. You know, Because the Gen Zs, they're the ones that don't have the adversity quotient that we have. Um, but they've got other things. I mean, it's not a negative to be a Gen Z. It's a positive because you're raised in a kind of a freedom, which is phenomenal. But you need to have um, a guide. Uh, and I even set up a, started running a, a business model called Abakapi, which is a Kosa word for somebody who accompanies, right? Which is um, the African version of the PESA model. You know, um, incubators, accelerators, they started to introduce in the US now, they're pulling away from that, the incubator accelerator, into what they call a PESA. Is this person who's like in a marathon runner's um, analogy who runs with you, teaches you, um, is an experienced marathon runner, and so they teach you. Now, what the abakapi is, is the opposite to a pacer. Yeah, we're there to mentor you, support you along the road, but we're not there to coddle. We're not there to hold your hand through the process. We're there to provide support when needed. And that's the key. There's still that mindset shift that we need to change. And I think it impacts them in the sense that they, they want to be seen as um, the pride. Ideally, I want to be able to have Cassie Catalyst change narratives, change mindsets in both the communities, right, in, in that way, that entrepreneurship is sexy, entrepreneurship is great. Guys, let's be entrepreneurs. We can't be employed as a population, as a mass, by 20% of the population. We can't all go and work for white business. It's, that's why we've got high unemployment levels. It's just not possible. There's no capacity for that. But if some of us are converting our mentality into entrepreneurship, and the irony is there's no household in the township that isn't an entrepreneur, an enterprise. So the opportunities are there. Mm. This is the time to do it. But the, the fear of not having a title, you know, um, and failure, the fear of failure. Mm. Oh, gosh. I don't know how many businesses of mine have failed, right? Um, and being a woman, the advantage you have as a black woman is that nobody is keeping score. 
because they don't expect you to be successful. Mm. So when you do fail, they're like, oh, I told you. And you can just go, yes, you were right. Everybody wins. But you know what? I now have experience. I can learn from this. Um, in the global environment, uh, American VCs would, used to go around talking about how they don't fund somebody who hasn't failed at least four times. You know, so failure in the markets where they've got a high number of entrepreneurs is because people don't frown upon failure. They don't look at failure the way we look at it. Here, if you're black and you fail, it's like, oh my God, she's a failure. She will never be able to live this down. I have so many businesses that have failed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, I'm, and I'm okay with it because the successes are easy, but the failures are the ones that teach us because you go back, you do an autopsy, you, you look at what went wrong, how, how I could have looked at it differently, what could I have fixed? You know, and those are the things that keep me at night, by the way. It's the failures. It's, and not because I failed, but more because how can I fix that thing? You know, I'm, I'm compulsive like that. So I, I sometimes go back to a business that failed 10, 15 years ago, and I'm just like, guys, can we just put this on the table? What do you think I could have done differently? And that's the other thing. You've got to always be open to having smarter people than you in the room constantly because it's the only way you, you push yourself out of comfort zones and eliminate this echo chamber you know South Africans are not echo chambers it's the worst I come in I start a business I bring 10 of my closest buddies into this place we all run this business together but all of us have group think we went mm. to the same schools we go to the same holiday houses mm, everything's the same 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 nobody's coming in with an alternative view uh, B is failing in South Africa, not because black people are corrupt or inept or whatever, but because white people don't have black people who are at the same level at the, as them that they can say, hey, Vusi, come and join my business and be comfortable. So because they don't have that, they then end up having to take their domestic worker. Um, come, Julia, I'm put, you know, they have to front them because everybody's like, oh, please don't talk about races. You know, because you're always talking about this. Yeah, no, you know what? I'm a black woman. And I have to live in this world as a black woman. And everywhere I go, people look at my race and they treat me in that way. So this is me being authentically myself. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't happen. It happens to me every day. Lucy, thank you. I could listen to you speak for hours. <laughs> You've uh, provided so much of value today and just so much of education for me personally. And I know that all of our viewers will also get the same amount of value. So thank you. And I also want to acknowledge you because just from what I'm hearing, you've always been underestimated and always over delivered when it comes to service and impact. So I want to acknowledge you for doing that, for to continue to do that in communities yeah. and just help so many people, entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter what they look like and where they're from, you continue to show up and do that. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for giving me your time. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I could talk all day. And just a parting shot is financial financial inclusion. Is, is the only game changer, you know? Forget what you heard about everything else. If we can just get more money to more township and rural entrepreneurs, it will completely elevate that environment, never mind everything else, you know? Mm, thank you.